Hi, everybody. This is Elaine Robinson. I am your host today. This is the um, MHPN, Michigan Historic Preservation Network, March webinar celebrating African American History Month with um, titled Nathan Johnson Building Detroit. Um, our ho oops, let me put my, I'm not sure if you can see my PowerPoint presentation or not. Let me put it, make sure it's up. Oops. Oh, yeah, now we have 15 people here, so. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, okay. All right, so um, so this is, um, we're Zooming this um, presentation today. Hopefully all of you guys have power. And for those of you who are joining us later um, or watch this later, um, it is being recorded. So we will be able to capture all those people who really wanted to attend and aren't able to because of the inclement weather here in Michigan. Um, in order to ask questions, you please just type them into your um, into the Q and A box as you think of them, and I will gather all those questions. And at the end of our conversation today, we will have um, at the end of Katie's presentation, we will have a, a question and answer period. If you don't see the Q&A box, you can use the chat. That will work for me as well. Um, and then in the chat window, we can, if we need to, we can put links in for resources that we discussed during the course of this presentation. Um, after, after the um, webinar is done, we do have an automatic survey that goes, goes out. So if you could participate in that for us too, I really would appreciate it. So this is our mission, MHPN advocates for Michigan's historic places to contribute to the economic vitality, sense of place and connection to the past. We could not do the good work we do without members and volunteers. So please consider joining MHPN today. In fact, if you join and you wanna to come to our conference on Mackinac Island, you get a discount. Our webinar series is sponsored by the Michigan Arts and Culture Council, um, we get a, a lovely grant from them that enables us to do one webinar a month, and you are participating in our March webinar. So today's webinar, Nathan Johnson Building Detroit, is presented by Katie Cook, an architectural historian with Kramer Design Group. Katie is nearing completion of her graduate degree in historic preservation from Eastern Michigan University. She enjoys research and utilizing geographic information systems, GIA, GIS, in historic preservation applications. With that, I am going to turn it over to Katie. Thank you. Is your screen sharing? All right. Yep. Okay. All right. Perfect. So, um, as Lane said, uh, my name is Katie. I'm an architectural historian at Kramer Design Group. Um, right now we're working on, um, on amending the National Register nomination for Second Baptist Church here in Detroit. And so that's um, how we got involved uh, with learning more about Nathan Johnson. And so this webinar will discuss Johnson's life the establishment of his Detroit architectural firm, and then we'll dive into Johnson's significant commissions. From there, his designs for Detroit area churches will be discussed, as will a selection of, of his designs from throughout his career. And then finally, the webinar will close with a discussion of his legacy. Nathan Johnson was born on April 9th, 1925 in Harrington, Kansas. And Harrington is a small town west of Kansas City and north of Wichita. And you can see it um, on the map on your lower right hand, on the lower right hand side of the screen. In the eighth grade, a teacher asked Johnson what he wanted to be when he grew up. And he said he wanted to be an artist. And the teacher replied, Nathan, artists aren't appreciated until after they're dead. Why don't you become an architect instead? And so this comment um, became the impetus for Johnson's study of architecture. 
Before attending college, he served in the U.S. Navy. And by 1950, he earned a Bachelor's of Science in Architecture from Kansas State University. And shortly after, in 1952, he married Ruth Ann Gardenhire. After graduating from Kansas State in 1950, Johnson came to Michigan and worked for local architects White and Griffin as a draftsman. White and Griffin uh, was established by Black architects Donald White and Francis Griffin. The firm made a point of providing mentorship to young Black architects. And White was the first Black architect licensed in Michigan. And White and Johnson met while at a convention for their shared fraternity, Kappa, Kappa Alpha Psi. And um, after a short time at the firm, Johnson was hired by Victor Gruen, the pioneer of the American shopping mall. And there he managed the design and the construction for the Eastland Shopping Center in Harper Woods. And that's a uh, pictured in the background. After working for other firms, Johnson established his own firm, Nathan Johnson and Associates, in 1956. Upon establishment, Johnson worked out of his home at 2041 Lawrence in Detroit. And that's pictured um, on the bottom there. In 1959, Johnson purchased a house at 2512 West Graham Boulevard to serve as a dedicated office space. He remodeled the house into his office and later purchased the neighboring house and merged the buildings together. The Sanborn map in the lower right corner shows the two flats that Johnson eventually made into his firm's offices, which are pictured um, on the upper right hand side of the screen. At one time, Johnson's firm employed a staff of around 40 people, and this included architects, technicians, planners, interior designers, spec writers, estimators, graphic specialists, model builders, and photographers. He also employed some of Detroit's leading Black architects, such as Donald White, who was Johnson's previous mentor, and Sidney Cobb. The firm was dedicated to mentoring young Black architects and students and hired local Black contractors to perform work. Black-owned All Trades Construction was one of the many Black contractors that Johnson worked with over the years. And the quote I have up here uh, from the Michigan Chronicle illustrates the dynamics of working at Nathan Johnson. The author states, projects in the firm are a team effort with the current staff of architects and engineers, Black and white, men and women, working together in harmony. And women were employed at the firm in both technical and managerial positions. Carol Harris was director of interior design and Lynette Mickle was the firm's specification writer. And uh, both of their images are here on the page. And then in the image in the upper right hand corner, um, you can see Johnson uh, showing students, um, perhaps from a local school, um, about architecture and his work at the firm. The majority of Johnson's work was for Detroit's Black community, which included churches and small offices. Johnson struggled to earn large commissions because of his color. And he stated that, I worked for four years before I had a job over $80,000. I designed homes, a small clinic here and there, a hospital addition, a church modernization, all small jobs. Jamon Jordan, Detroit city historian, explains that, Johnson ran into the Midwest version of Jim Crow. Blacks can vote and earn a good wage, but if a white firm or a wealthy white client is asking for an architect, what they don't want to see is a black designer. And the images on this uh, slide show des Johnson's designs for small medical offices, often owned and operated by black doctors, dentists, and medical professionals. Johnson's designs were modernist and used, as Docomomo writes, boldly modern structural elements. And as the Detroit News writes, Johnson's work is scattered across Detroit and is found in surrounding suburbs. Not only did Johnson design new buildings, he also recognized the need to invest in existing neighborhoods and renovate existing buildings, as evidenced by his renovation of his firm's offices. 
and he occupied a role in Detroit's growing preservation movement in the 1960s. To Johnson, new and old can stand side by side if both represent good architecture. A building stands on its own merits if it has integrity, if it fits its site, if it serves a need. Perhaps Johnson's largest example of adaptive reuse is the 1963 renovation of the Oriole Theater at 8430 Linwood into the New Bethel Baptist Church. New Bethel was forced to move from its original location on Hastings due to urban renewal. Johnson was adept at utilizing the existing structure to accommodate the church while also incorporating a distinctly modern design. And so, um, the original theater is there on the lower right hand corner and then Johnson's design um, is in the upper right hand corner. And also pictured here is his uh, design for Stanley's Mania Cafe, which is at 265 East Baltimore. Stanley's Mania Cafe was constructed in 1962 and the building was both advertising and architecture. And Johnson says that you could see the tower from the boulevard and that would draw people to Stanley's. The exterior was clad in cast concrete painted white and concrete aggregate panels. The restaurant owned by Stanley Hong was unique in that it was welcoming to Detroit's black community. Black Detroiters could eat at Stanley's without the discrimination they faced at other establishments in the city. The building remains standing today, and there are currently plans to, re to redevelop the space as a performing arts venue. Johnson also designed the Hong family's residence at 961 West Boston Boulevard in Detroit's Boston Edison District. Built in 1962, the house was featured in the Detroit Free Press. Clad in white brick and red panels and beams, the modern style house stands out from its surroundings of early 20th century revival styles. Yet the scale of the house and its placement on the lot ensure that it integrates into its surroundings. The images on the, le on the left hand side of the screen uh, show the home's interior living space and the view of the house from the rear. And you can tell it looks really cool inside. Another significant commission of Johnson's was the 1968 addition to the Second Baptist Church of Detroit. The addition connects to the historic church and contains the church's educational rooms, gathering spaces, and offices. Johnson was able to design the addition to sit within the dense urban fabric of the church's surroundings while also providing additional space and even a rooftop garden. The image at the right is from the Second Baptist Church archives and shows various and shows various building stages. And then the picture at the bottom left uh, shows the interior of the building with its large windows, glass partitions, and use of painted concrete block walls. In 1974, Johnson's design for Bethel AME Church was completed. As shown in the image at the top right corner, the church was just one component of Johnson's design for the church's complex. The church stands out because of its unique shape and roof line. The church was forced to move from its previous location at Frederick and St. Antoine due to one of Detroit's urban renewal projects. Yet, yet elements from the previous church, such as wall paneling, doorknobs, and plaques were incorporated into the new church. Additional buildings were to include an educational and community center and apartments. The church secured government funding for construction of housing in the church's complex. The townhouses pictured on the lower right hand side of the screen are the townhouses Johnson designed for the complex. Housing on the site was utilitarian as government funding was tight and left little room for design flourishes. Built sometime between 1961 and 1964, St. Clement's Episcopal Church in Inkster is another one of Johnson's designs. The church is located in southwest Inkster and serves the predominantly Black community. The shape of the church recalls an upturned ship's hull, 
which as we will see was used by Johnson and other Detroit area churches. The Episcopal Church of the Resurrection is located along West Outer Drive in Ecorse. Carrying on the sculptural nature of Johnson's designs, the church's roof, quoting Johnson, lifts your eyes to heaven. Funding for the construction of the church came from a variety of sources, but perhaps most notably um, was that the predominantly white congregation at Christ Episcopal Church in Bloomfield Hills gave $20,000 to the black congregation at Resurrection for construction of the church. And um, in the upper left-hand corner, that's um, Johnson's design as published in the Free Press in 1962. Another one of Johnson's churches with the upturned ship's hull is Church of Christ Conant Gardens on Conant. Located in Conant Gardens, a black middle-class neighborhood in Detroit, the church was built in 1962. And on the right-hand side is an image of the church's interior dating to 1963. Um, and then on the left uh, is the exterior. And you can see the, um, the interesting roof line he added to the single story uh, section of the church. Oak Grove AME, located on Cherry Lawn on Detroit's northwest side, is near the Eight Mile Wyoming neighborhood. The church was built around 1965 and in Johnson fashion features the upturned ship's hull shape. The interior shown at left uses the church's structure as ornament with expanses of brick and wood. Lomax AME Church at 17 441 De Quinder was built sometime between 1967 and 1963. The church's proposed design was highlighted in a, in a Detroit Free Press article from 1964, and that's shown in the upper right-hand corner. The rendering in the article shows a two-story building attached to the left-hand side of the church, which appears to have been modified when the church was eventually constructed. The church is clad in brick and beige, and brown concrete aggregate panels. Located in Detroit's Virginia Park neighborhood, the Johnson designed addition to Grace Episcopal Church was constructed around 1969. The distinctive hexagonal shape and pointed roof lines of the southern section of the addition show Johnson's modernist style. The exterior is clad in blonde brick and tall stained glass panels are placed at the corners of the hexagon. Many of Johnson's commissions stemmed from his involvement in Detroit's Black business community. In 1957, Johnson designed the House of Diggs, a local funeral home enterprise catering to Detroit's Black community. The funeral home's owner, Charles Diggs, was a Michigan politician who became the first African-American elected to Congress from Michigan in 1955. Johnson designed many of the buildings associated with the House of Diggs and other businesses associated with the Diggs family. The Michigan Chronicle featured Johnson's work on the funeral home. The images on the right-hand side of the screen show how Johnson took an existing structure and created a modern funeral home. The gable of the existing house is visible in the upper right-hand corner of the top image, and this becomes the glass-clad gable of the funeral home following the renovation, which is pictured on the lower right-hand side. On the left-hand side of the screen, this shows Johnson's design for Detroit Metropolitan Mutual Assurance's home offices located at 675 Mac. Detroit Metropolitan Mutual had offices in Black neighborhoods throughout the city and catered to Detroit's Black community. And I really like uh, the text that accompanies this advertisement. It says, you too are included in Detroit's plans for a brighter future.
Johnson's addition to Mercy General Hospital at 668 Winder was hailed by the Michigan Chronicle as an outstanding design created by Johnson, whose fresh architectural ideas have gained national notice. For the addition, Johnson only had a small amount of land to work with and had to tie the addition to the existing building. The addition contained a waiting area, record room, and offices. Johnson used materials that were readily available, affordable, and required little maintenance. The exterior was clad in red brick, beige ceramic tile panels, and white and gray stone cast in black concrete. In 1961, Johnson's modern design for Wright Mutual Life Insurance Company's offices at 2995 East Graham Boulevard was completed. To complete the project, Johnson worked with Black landscape art architect Elon Mickles and Black-owned contractors All Trades Construction. Johnson had a long working relationship with Wright Mutual, designing many of, of their offices throughout the city. In 1961, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Another design completed in 1961 was the Great Lakes Mutual Life Insurance Company, located at 8435 Woodward between Philadelphia and Euclid. The office building was home to Black Owned Life Insurance Company, to the Black Owned Life Insurance Company, and the building still stands today. Located at 1881 East Graham Boulevard, the Bessie Whitman Memorial Center was constructed in 1973. Johnson's design for the building harkens back to his design for Stanley Hong's residence in 1962. The building is clad in red brick and concrete aggregate panels. A Detroit Free Press article from 1973 details how the interior of the nursing home is anything but drab. The interior boasts a chapel, a large dining room, and pea green, hot pink, and bright yellow walls. Another one of Johnson's designs that is unfortunately no longer standing was the Interpretive Nature Center in Eliza Howell Park near Telegraph and Fanco. The octagonal building was situated amongst the trees had a cantilever deck overlooking the trees and wildlife and had a glass enclosed observation room. The exterior was clad in brick and the interior featured brick and laminated wood. And the image on the left um, is DTE aerial imagery from 1981. And by 1997, uh, the Interpretive Nature Center was gone. Through Johnson's work, he developed a solid reputation in Detroit and across the country as a creative architect working to support Black residents in Detroit. This image, which is, which is almost assuredly one of Johnson's designs, was for a proposed Diggs business complex at Woodward and Mack. The Michigan Chronicle often wrote about Johnson's work throughout the city, claiming that Johnson was their favorite architect. And in another statement, the Chronicle describes how the new Detroit Metropolitan Mutual Insurance Company building on Mac near McLennan is so beautiful. It was designed by Nathan Johnson, who else? And this speaks to Johnson's reputation throughout the city and his positive impact. Johnson was recognized for his work throughout his life. In November of 1958, Johnson was one of 18 Black architects featured in Ebony Magazine. His design for the Samuel H. Thomas home was also featured. The proposed design included a six-bedroom house, five-car carport, a large boathouse, and a dance pavilion. And I tried to find if this house was ever built because uh, it would be awesome to see, but I could not determine uh, where it was. Or or if it was ever built. In December of that year, the monthly bulletin of the Michigan Society of Architects featured the, the Ebony Magazine article. And in, and in 2018, Johnson was awarded the gold medal by the American Institute of Architects. 
And there's a picture um, on the lower right hand on the lower left hand side with Johnson and Rainey Hamilton uh, from uh, from when he won his award. Throughout his career, Johnson was dedicated to supporting Detroit's Black community. He spoke out against discrimination faced by Black contractors and architects in securing City of Detroit contracts. And in his jobs, he, he hired minority architects. In 1960, he, partner, he partnered with local builder Edward Burke and mortgage banker James Del Rio to incorporate Trans World Investment Company. The company focused on residential and commercial developments in Detroit and neighboring suburbs. Johnson participated in the Special Youth Employment Program to provide young adults with classroom instruction on wide-ranging topics and on-the-job training. And in 1968, he lent support to the establishment of Detroit's first Black-owned bank, First Independence National. He also participated in Harambe, a group of active Black business leaders working to support housing and business developments in Black neighborhoods in Pontiac, Michigan. Due to his work, he, rece he received various honors from local organizations for his contributions to the community. He received awards from the Booker T. Washington Business Association in 1989 and the Opportunities Industrialization Center in 1975. And listed at right are the numerous memberships and appointments Johnson held. Um, so he was a member of the American Institute of Architects, the Michigan Society of Architects, the National Technical Association, National Organization of Minority Architects, and uh, the list goes on. He was involved with the city of Detroit. He was a commissioner for the Detroit Historic District Commission a commissioner for the Wayne County Planning Commission, and also a commissioner for the Building Authority. And so he did a lot of work in the city uh, throughout his life and almost always tying back to uh, his support of the Black community and uh, designing great buildings uh, for people throughout the city. And does anyone have questions or comments? Thank you, Katie. Um, yes, we do have questions. The first is, do you know if Johnson had difficulties in being admit, accepted into architecture school? Um, the writer of the question said that he, that they know that the University of Michigan was accepting the first African-American students, but not every school was doing so when um, Johnson was, was looking at his education um so so that i don't i'm not sure um i didn't come across any of that um in my research mm -hmm. um but i guess thinking of of him going to school in kansas where he was from um perhaps that wasn't the case um or else he would have maybe gone somewhere farther from home but that's just you know i you know, there's no information to back that up. That's just sure. my can guess. You, can you remind us when he would have gone to college? It was because he was, I'm sorry, I think he was said he was in the service. Yeah, he was so. in the service. And then uh, he graduated in 1950 uh, from Kansas State. Okay, so so it would have been early 50s that he would have been looking at architecture school. Yeah, that would be interesting to see if, if we could find out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another writer said that you're already building a database of Nathan Johnson's work. How do you com how complete do you think it is? And did the firm keep a log of its projects? And along with that, I wonder, is the firm still in existence? Um, I know the firm still owns, um, I think, at least part of the building where the offices were. Um, but uh, what records they have, I'm not sure. Um, I imagine that there are a lot of other buildings that he did, um, you know, that, that just weren't mentioned in the papers 
or homes yeah. he did for people. Um, cause there were some articles I came across where um, it said how uh, Johnson uh, designed summer homes for the wealthy and uh, just mentioned him designing a lot of homes. And okay. <clears throat> I didn't come across a lot of those except for Stanley Hong's residence. Um, but I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Right. Did, did you look at the AIA directory? I know that there's three versions of them from the early, was it late 50s, early 60s, and into the early 70s that have so, a partial list of some of the projects? Yeah, I looked at that. Um, I forget what year. I think he's listed in all of the years, but it's the first year he's listed where it lists um, a lot of his projects. Oh, so okay. most of those were included in the presentation, but right. perhaps other editions have other listings or... Sure. Um, so, does yeah. he have, does, are there any other of his buildings that are listed on the National Register? I know you're working on Second Baptist, but is there anything else that he did? Um, I guess I, I don't recall off the top of my head. But perhaps some of the churches, um, right. like Bethel, um, they might be on the register, but I, um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. The, well, and I, I would think that part of the issue is, like, some of his big churches, like the one, the Franklin's Church, Reverend Franklin's Church, um, it was remodeled from something else, but its association with Franklin and... Johnson would be huge, you know. So right. mm -hmm. interesting. Might be something that a future historian project for somebody out there. Um, yeah, I think there'd be a lot of if someone had a lot of time, I think they could yeah. uncover a lot about him. We need to talk he, to the students at Eastern Michigan. <laughs> yes. Yes. He that's that's one thing I took away from uh, really researching him is he did so much work. Right. Uh, for so many different uh, companies and people that, you know, I think his work is prob probably all over the place, but I wonder know, if it was for uh, like small, like yeah. s small offices, you know, things right. that wouldn't necessarily make it into the paper. I wonder if the, um, if, if he has any collections in the local archives. Um, including the African American Museum. Um, mm -hmm. I know that they have an archival collection. It would be interesting to see if any of their materials include work that he did. Right. Be great to see drawings, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and Second Baptist has um, some drawings of their edition that we were able to look at when oh, we good. visited their archives. Oh, good. I loved his logo on one of the graphics that you showed us. His logo. Oh, yes. It was very, very cool. So it was very mid-century, you know, mm -hmm. almost um, kind of like flying NJ, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Inkster, one of our, our participants asks, um, says that Inkster is doing a phenomenal job in identifying the history and architectural resources related to the Malcolm X house. Mm -hmm. Is any of the work that um, of Nathan Johnson going to be woven into that interpretation, to your knowledge? Um, I guess into the into the interpretation with uh, Malcolm X, I'm not sure, but um, we're also doing a survey in Inkster um, of African American housing, and so we've um, made note of uh, this church here, St. Clement's Episcopal, that he designed and um, other buildings in Inkster that he was involved with. Great. So we'll, you know, wrap it into our report. Um, but if it if it gets wrapped into the Malcolm X house, that I'm not sure of. Right. Well, it's good that you're doing this, the Inkster survey too. So um, Janet Krieger asks, says that your discussion of the materials that Nathan Johnson used for his buildings indicates he wasn't using some of the experimental materials other modernists were employing has this contributed to their ability to survive um perhaps because he was when he was designing his buildings um he often had as he put it a shoestring budget 
So um, he picked materials that were easy to procure, easy to take care of, um, looked good, and uh, I guess in some ways were tried and true because he didn't want um, his, his buildings to encounter problems with the materials or try, you know, with experimental things, you know, try something and have it fail because um, when he was designing buildings, it was often for churches or um, businesses that didn't have an extensive budget. So perhaps that is why um, a lot of his buildings are still around and also uh, people use them. So, you know, people still go to these churches and, and they're still used today. And so I think that's a big part of it too. Right. That's, I think that um, that's a good point about, you know, he had to look at practicality and whether or not he could be doing crazy things with roof lines and things that, that would result in water pouring down the interior walls, and which is part mm -hmm. of the problem with other modernist buildings. I have another question that um, a participant asks, if you're building a context for African-American designers and builders in Michigan, for purposes of getting these materials listed on the National Register of Historic Places, could the work of Johnson's become thematic nomination of properties across the city? Um, I think it could be part of a of a um, multiple property documentation form. Um, I think his work and the work of other black architects and builders, um, you know, I think there's a lot of information there and a lot of history that um, hasn't really been written yet. And um, even with Inkster, we've found where uh, one of the neighborhoods was built, uh, we think almost exclusively by Black builders and Black architects, um, you know, but there's kind of nothing published about them right now. So I think, you know, if there was a thematic survey of uh, Johnson's work and other right. Black architects, that would be really helpful because it's all out there. Um, it's just nothing has really been written about it yet. Have you, is the project, you mentioned the project in Inkster, is it a, mm -hmm. a survey? Is it a National Register nomination? Can it's you... a survey. It's a okay. reconnaissance and intensive level survey. Okay, so is there intention possibly down the road for a, nom a National Register nomination or? Perhaps. Perhaps. Okay. Um, one of our participants wants to know what your favorite project, built or unbuilt, was by Johnson. Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's so hard to ask in the middle of, yeah. You've just looked at 40,000 buildings. What would you do with <laughs> I think, I think probably one of his houses. Okay. I know, all I know of is uh, Stanley Hong and yeah, that. Um, the, the design for, I think it was Samuel H. Thomas. I think that would be really cool to see. Right. And um, I guess I know it's probably built somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not. <laughs> Is that the one with the boat dock and the? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that yeah. would be interesting to see that one too. Yeah, Nathan Niedering tells us that Beth, um, New Bethel is listed on the National Register, so that was a an answer, a question answered that quickly. Thank you, Nathan. Awesome. Um, Another attendee wants to know what the funding source is for getting your research done and what do you plan to do next? Um, <laughs> I guess what do I plan to do next is... Uh, Whatever's up on the docket. <laughs> yeah, whatever's on my calendar. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think a lot of this can be worked into um, the Second Baptist uh, right. nomination because as it stands now his addition is it is non-contributing so you know we're working to uh add the addition to the yeah. nomination to as update a, the nomination with yeah. the information about that so that's a great place right. to add a lot of information i can mm -hmm. see how all of this would be would be bundled into that yeah 
Um, um, so yeah. Do you know, um, do you say more, oh, can you say any more about the summer houses he designed? They sound very interesting. Um, that's, that's something I really don't know a lot about. Right. That's like, I, I read tidbits here and there, um, and some of the articles about him that he designed summer houses up for the wealthy, um, or upper, upper middle class, but, uh, where they are, I don't know. Right. Um, I was thinking uh, today, actually, maybe there are some by Idlewild. I was just wondering about that. For those of you who don't know, yeah. I'm, um, working on a project for Idlewild. I'm also an architectural historian and I'm working on a, an Idlewild project. And, you know, it was a community that um, was developed for middle and upper class African-American um, people who wanted to get away from everything. And, but most of the houses up there, if you're not familiar with it, most of the houses up there are pretty modest Although there are a few that I could see maybe some of his touches in. There's this really great little green one with a kind of angled, steeply sl slanted um, shed roof that I, I could see his name being attached to that. So, um, Well, and there was, um, he said in one article that like throughout his career, he, he, like there was kind of no commission too small because he recognized at the beginning, you know, when, uh, you know, he like was perhaps struggling to get commissions or at least large commissions that all of these like uh, smaller buildings really like supported him. And so he right. recognized that like throughout his career. So it wouldn't surprise me if even like a, a modest small house he, he designed. Right, right. Because if someone came to him, I don't know that he would turn them down. Um, what, we have another participant that says that he knows, we know that the Nathan, Nathan Johnson's work will not be part of the Malcolm X House projects. It's in the city of Inkster as is the whole, as a whole that's a, doing a phenomenal job in getting a handle on their resources and history. Are there Johnson projects being woven into the city's efforts of interpretation and heritage tourism? Um, so I imagine that once we uh, submit our work and submit our report that, you know, that's a good possibility. Because possibility, yeah. this church isn't far from the Malcolm X house, only a right. few streets over. Huh. Um, and so maybe I could imagine a... that it could be you know, part of a larger plan. It could be part of a tour or something, you know, the mm -hmm. starting point of a tour or something. Yeah, that would be right. fun. Yeah. Um, Katie reminds us, or excuse me, Janet reminds us that Katie is speaking at MHPN's conference on Mackinac Island from May 11th to the 13th and headquartered at Historic Mission Point Resort. Hey, Katie, can you say more about your, your session there? Um, way, so everyone's invited to attend. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll be talking about Inkster um, and, you know, how that can be uh, used for, for how the information that we're finding can be used for heritage tourism. And um, some members of the project, uh, we hope, dream, and believe will be with us. Um, and they're the ones who are doing the Malcolm X house. Right. And um, yeah, we'll be up there to talk about Inkster, I'll talk about our survey report. Uh, they'll talk about the Malcolm X House, um, which is in our survey or in the vicinity of our survey area. Right. Um, so yeah, it'll be all about Inkster, which is great because <laughs> I can talk a lot about Inkster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can. <laughs> um. For those of you interested in attending the conference, you can learn more about it at our website. It's www.mhpn.org. I did want to um, thank you, Katie. I think that's the end of our questions. You did a great job. All right. Well, thanks, really everyone. Excited. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to tell our listeners about um, MHPN's Advocacy Day, which will be held in two parts this year. It is... Um, a workshop that will be held on April 19th from 8.30 to 10 a.m. And that will be um, 
giving people who are, are attending the, the virtual visits um, some talking points and some areas of concern for the network. So when you have your appointment to speak with your state legislators, that you will um, be able to, to talk proficiently about our, our issues and concerns. And then the virtual visits will happen on Friday, April 21st. They'll be scheduled by our um, consulting firm that we work with, um, Kaylee Hawthorne. And they um, they are, I think I just screwed up their name and I apologize for that. Um, but the, those sessions are from nine to four on Friday, April 21st. Attendance is $35 for um, non-members or for members and $25 for students and seniors. Um, again, you can learn more about that at mhpn.org slash state. It's under state advocacy information. For those of you looking to share this, this video um, webinar with your friends and family, I will let you know that it won't be posted. Normally we get them posted pretty quickly. It's gonna be a slight pause in that because the person who does that had a baby on Monday. So congratulations, Shaohan, uh, Bao Smith, and um, welcome, Isabel. And we will get this up as soon as she gets back from maternity leave, which should be in April. Otherwise, thank you all for attending. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next month when we talk about the um, Moore Park Pool in Lansing, Michigan. Thanks again, Katie. Bye-bye.